Well, good morning, everyone. How are you feeling this morning? I really do want to re-welcome everyone. Uh, if you're watching live, thanks so much for tuning in. And uh, great to have everybody together as a church family this morning. Uh, hopefully, uh, last week was informative and maybe helpful for your life. Uh, we did kick off our series, uh, When People Are Big. Well, sorry. When small is big, actually. And uh, let's go ahead and let's put that series graphic on up right there. So we see the we have our little golden cat there and the big shadow. And the big shadow really represents how people can become so big in our life. How they can essentially dominate who we are. And that's a problem. And it was the inspiration is based off of this book right here. When people are big and God is small, and if you haven't gotten it, uh, again, I make uh, no profits from uh, advertising this book or promoting it, but it has changed my life tremendously, and it really could help yours as well. If you remember, little recap, uh, week one, we talked about recognize, week two, today, is identify, and the last week, which is going to be two weeks from now, is going to be purge, so do a little fear detox, if that's okay with you. And uh, so it's going to be, uh, our time together, I think, is going to be instructive. It's helped me a lot because the truth is the fear of man can be a huge theme in all of our lives, can it? I mean, it really can. And there's three reasons why. Because number one, we fear exposure. We fear because people can expose us. Number two, we fear rejection And number three, we fear being hurt. With exposure, it goes like this. We fear people because they can expose and humiliate us. We fear rejection because people can reject, ridicule, or despise us. And number three, we fear being hurt because people can attack, oppress, or threaten us. And we even did a top 10 list uh, last week. And if you, you know... uh, kind of listen through that. You may have related to one, two. I had someone come up to me after and say, hey, I was eight out of the 10. Is that okay? So I was like, you know what? Probably a lot of us are at least over five on that. And last week, I shared a little bit vulnerably about my story in seventh grade trying to impress Jody Papusha. You guys remember that? And my epic fail in doing so. Well, this week, I want to go back even a little bit further in my childhood to when I was three years old. Okay, so that's me at three years old. And apparently, I was sharing my popsicle uh, with one of my neighbors. And we lived at that time in Michigan. Both of my parents are going to University of Michigan. And (laughs) got a fan. So both my parents are going to University of Michigan. We were in the uh, grad school housing there. And I guess the way it worked is that in, in the grad school housing, we had a really nice cul-de-sac, and there's a little park right in the middle. And we grew a garden, and you could grow tomatoes and beans. And my mom told me that I used to take the green tomatoes and just pick them right off the vine and eat them because I just loved them. And so it was a great, a great little setup. Well, as, as can happen, as we have experienced here in Jacksonville, and maybe you watch online to where you are, a storm can roll through your city, right? And when storms roll through, sometimes tornadoes roll through. And so uh, in, in the Northeast, you have these things called basements. Have you guys heard of those? <laughs> basements, they're like under the ground. It's really weird. Cellars, some people might say. And so we, we heard there was a tornado warning, so we all went downstairs into the basement to wait it out. And apparently this tornado, this big tornado actually rolled a couple miles within our house. And so we were down there for hours. And then finally we got the all clear. And when we, when we got the all clear, everyone started going upstairs, but I wouldn't, I was holding onto the banister. I was terrified. And, and, and my mom's trying to get me and I won't go. And finally, uh, we went up, they went upstairs and my mom said, Dennis, that's my dad's name, Dennis, please go down and have a, a, a man to son talk, <laughs> father to son talk, man to boy, and, and, and help him out. So my dad went downstairs and he said, Jonathan, look, everything's okay. I mean, what are you afraid of? And I said, dad, well, something like this. 
the great tomato is going to come and spit seeds at me. See, the whole time they've been saying this great tornado, great tornado, I thought they'd been saying the great tomato. And I had this vision of this huge swirling tomato, machine gun seeds going everywhere. And so in my mind, (laughs) there was a huge tornado ready to pounce on me outside. From that day on, I did not ever eat tomatoes. Until I studied the Bible and I actually, which was when I was 19 and three quarters years old, and I, and I, I read Paul said, I become all things to all men. I thought, you know what? I'm going to have to like tomatoes if I'm going to follow this scripture. And so I started sticking these slimy tomatoes in my mouth and I hated it. It was disgusting. But I will tell you, you can retrain your brain because I love tomatoes now. However, I say all that to say that that fear of a huge swirling tomato in my front yard was completely unfounded, wasn't it? It was completely unfounded. And yet that affected me from that time when I was eating tomatoes green off the vine in in, in the garden, that it completely changed the way I felt about tomatoes. And it's, it's interesting because I think that that parallels the way that we can fear man sometimes. Because we can get these fears that can be unfounded, and we have all these thoughts that cycle through our mind, right? What about the fear of disappointing someone? Anybody fear sometimes where you're like, oh, I just don't want to, if you hear these words, but what if they? Oh, but what if they? But, but what if, what if she Oh, but what if my, it's like our minds can get consumed. And isn't it true, guys? Half the time, those fears are really unfounded. And yet we make this into a huge swirling tomato in our office place, in our school, in our family, and we blow it way out of proportion. We don't want to disappoint people, and we fear these things. And, but, but here's the thing. Story after story we experience in our life from the time we might be three years old or maybe you're a teen and you're experiencing some of that in, in school right now or maybe in, you know, you're in your 30s and, and 40s and you're starting to have teenagers and things like that or children and you're, you have your fears there and you have your parents and, or maybe you're 80, 81 years old you know, and you have your own fears. Uh, one of the most inspiring things of my Week this week is for sure hearing that we're going to have a baptism. I mean, I, I, that, that is awesome. And, but we can have these fears. And, and sometimes these fears are grounded in reality. I had someone recently share with me that, that because she has felt um, overweight, she felt like she knew her dad was going to be disappointed in her. And so for three years, she didn't go see her dad. For three years. And then he wasn't doing well physically. And she was debating, she was wrestling whether or not to go see her dad. And you know, when she went to see her dad, sure enough, her dad did not talk to her. And when she told me this, this pained my heart. Because not only did she have the fear, in that case, it came true. It came true. Her dad didn't want to speak to her because he felt that she was overweight. And he was, he was not doing well. He was dying from what I remember she told me. And it's things like that that are so interesting because sometimes they're unfounded and sometimes they're founded. But you know, the same thing is true though is that we cannot allow the judgments and the, other, the opinions of other people to dominate our whole life, Right? We can't let that control us. So somehow, we have to find a way to navigate through that. It's interesting because in Jeremiah 17, it says this, Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in the wastelands. They will not see prosperity when it comes. In other words, you could have a great life. You could have great things going on right now. But if you're trusting in man, if you're putting all your hope in man, 
you know what's happening? Is that you won't see prosperity even when it's right in front of you. You could actually be experiencing prosperity right now, but you won't even see it because you're so consumed with man. Is this, am I the only one that feels that way or is this resonating with you guys? You know, and, and, and that's a problem and we have to learn how to navigate this. This happens all throughout our life. My son Joshua, who, you know, who's 10 now, this last year he came one, one home from school one day and he, we were driving and, and he started telling me how he was getting kind of bullied at school for being skinny, and they called him scrawny. And at one point, and he's, he's a pretty, like, you know, wiry, like, muscular little dude, but you know what? He's, he's definitely not, he's not built like a tank. And so they were joking around with him. They were laughing at him and whatever, and he just busted out crying in the car. I mean, just weeping. And it really hurt me, but it kind of made me indignant because part of what I felt was like, no, you know what? I've got to do my job as a dad to help him to not be controlled by these other people and what, what they're saying. And so I said, I, I, I gave him some spiritual insights and, you know, and, and some, some thoughts from the scriptures. And then I said, but now what I want to do is I also want to look at Taylor Swift's song, Shake It Off. <laughs> and so, and it was interesting because I went to, I went to YouTube and I looked at Shake It Off and I said, let's read some of the comments from the song Shake It Off, which is all about shaking off the criticism. And you know what? Half of them were awesome. Like, Taylor, you're awesome. Thank you for this song. And half of them were horrible. Like someone had to skip by. And I'm thinking, how ironic that this song about shaking stuff off has all this criticism as well. Somehow, we need to shake off in the right spiritual way the things that are swirling around us, and we have to learn to do that. And I think today we can learn a little bit from the Israelites in Exodus chapter 32 in verse 1. And the backdrop of this passage is interesting because as many of you guys know, and it's okay if you're the first time you know, out and, and maybe you've never read the Bible before, that's okay, I'm going to catch you on up. The Israelites had fled Egypt to escape because they were enslaved. And now they're out in the desert. And so here they are approaching Mount Sinai. And Moses goes up on Mount Sinai. And he gets the the Ten Commandments, but not in written form, but just orally. And so God's telling him, hey, this is how you should live. And here are some guidelines. And then he goes back down. And then they go back up the mountain with 70 elders and Moses and his brother Aaron and then also a couple other leaders, and they're communing with God. And so they're all up there, and they're, they're, they're communing with God. How powerful would that be? Then the rest of them go down the mountain, and then God calls Moses to come back up to get the actual Ten Commandments in tablet form with, his, with Joshua, his aide. And so they go up there, and who does, who does Moses leave in charge? his brother Aaron, right? And what happens while he's up on that mountain? Well, he takes a little too long. Have you guys ever waited before? Do you like waiting? Raise your hand if you love to wait. I would just like to see. We have one person that loves to wait. Pretty much nobody likes to wait. In today's society, you know, they... 12 years ago, the average human attention span, they calculated at 12 seconds. Right now, it's at something like eight. The average goldfish, they calculate to be nine. (laughs) Do you know how disturbing that is? That we have a shorter attention span than goldfish. But that's the way it is. Even yesterday here, we were at the internet and my, uh, we were here at the church and my son was like, I, Dad, I just can't do this slow internet. I mean, that's the society that we have today. We just want it right now, right now, right now. Well, they had to wait 40 days and 40 nights for Moses to come back. And while that was happening, they were getting extremely restless. And it's with that that we read this. 
It says, when the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Aaron answered, take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast into the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you out of Egypt. So they're waiting and they fashion this golden calf and they start worshiping that. And here's one of the things that's interesting about this. It was a precedent for Jeroboam. Later, if you remember when Israel split into two, for those of us who, who have re- understand this story, well, Jeroboam quotes like this exact same line. And he says, here are your gods. Here are your gods. Let's keep going. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day, the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented, presented fellowship offerings. Afterward, they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. Then the Lord said to Moses, go down because your people whom you brought up out of Egypt have become corrupt. They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. Yeah, um, at this point, it's time to talk. (laughs) Because God is about to smite his very own people. Because they, their hearts are so hard that they're worshiping this golden calf instead of the true God. And so what happens is Moses begs God and he communes with God and he prays. He says, please relent. Now, it's interesting, and this, we don't have time to go into it today, but the whole concept of prayer and how we can commune and connect and perhaps even move God's heart in a direction is an interesting, very interesting subject that we should really cover at some point. But suffice it to say that God says, okay, fine. I will not smite them. There will be a punishment later, however, And so Moses goes down the mountain, and this is what happens. Moses turned and went down the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant law in his hands. They were were inscribed on both sides, front and back. The tablets were the work of God. The writing was the writing of God on the tablets. When Joshua heard the noise of the people shouting, he said to Moses, "There there is the sound of war in the camp. Moses replied, it is not the sound of victory. It is not the sound of defeat. It is the sound of singing that I hear. When Moses approached the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, his anger burned and he threw the tablets out of his hand, breaking them to pieces at the foot of the mountain. And he took the calf the people had made and burned it in the fire. Then he ground it to powder, scattered it on the water, and made the Israelites drink it. Moses was not messing around. He, he burns this calf in the fire. He smashes it up. He grinds it up. And then he puts it into powder just so that it's a lesson. They will never forget that this idol is worth nothing. And then it says, he said to Aaron, what did these people do to you that you led them into such great sin. Now, this is interesting, okay? And how do we relate this to the fear of men? Do not be angry, my Lord, Aaron answered. You know how prone to evil these people are. (laughs) They said to me, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. So I told them, Whoever has any gold jewelry, take it off. Then they gave me the gold. Then I threw it in the fire, 
and out came this calf. That is the worst dog ate my homework excuse I've ever heard, hands down. That's going to be in the history books. So I don't know. Aaron says, out came this calf. I mean, I'm just a victim, right? I'm just a victim of the things going around me at work. I mean, when, when people tell these tur- dirty jokes or when, I mean, I just, they said to me, I, I mean, Enron, how did Enron happen? If you guys know about Enron and, and the scandals that can happen at workplaces, people get swept up into all this kind of stuff. And it's interesting because the Israelites felt that they needed something. They needed something more than what God had to offer. So let's, let's talk about this tension for a second, if we could kind of create this space. Why in the world would we let idols rule our life? Why would they let an idol rule their life? Why would they make this idol? Why does that even make sense? Well, number one, when they came out of Egypt, they were needy. They were vulnerable. But when they got to the desert and Moses was up there, you know what happens is you start to feel kind of out of control. Remember what it was like before we had cell phones, some of us, when you actually couldn't just text someone to say, where are you? That was only like, what, 15 years ago <laughs> or something? But now it's like you're on demand all the time. But they couldn't, they felt like they, they weren't sure what God was going to do. How did they know that God was going to bless them? Have you ever felt that way before? I mean, how do I really know, God, that you're going to X, Y, or Z? And so what starts to happen in the human heart, I believe, is that we want something that we can control. And people or idols can sometimes fit the bill. And so now when they had this golden calf, here was something that they could manage, that they could control. And that's part of the huge dynamic and the answer to why we put too much emphasis and small becomes big. But the problem is now they had less. Because, see, before they had God, and now the punishment, part of their punishment was this. God said, you know what? Okay, I'm with you, but I'm I'm slightly distant. You didn't want me, and now my presence is going to be with you, an angel is going to be with you, but but you're going to journey on, and I'm not going to be exactly right next to you the way I was before. So they had their idol, which they wanted to fill them up, but what they could have really had to fill them up was now distant. And as it turns out, we also have a favorite idol. What's our favorite idol? People. People. People are our favorite idol. It's interesting, a quote from the book that I was referencing before says this. When we think of idols, we usually think first of Baal and other material, man-made creations. Next, we might think of money. We rarely picture our spouse, our children, or a friend from school. But people are our idol of choice. They predate bail, money, and power. Like all idols, people are created things, not the creator. And they do not deserve our worship. They are worshiped because we perceive that they have power to give us something. We think they can bless us. And so that is the reason why so much people are our idol of choice because we think that they can bless us. They think, we think that they can fill us up. We think that they are the ones that can give us what we need in, inside of our heart. And so that's why I think a lot of, as much as I'm a complete fan of leveraging media and technology to do good, there's also in the dark side, isn't it? The dark, and I was kind of half joking when I put number 10 last week, which was number 10 is, you know, if you, if you post something on Facebook and then immediately rush a couple minutes later to see how many likes you have, but that's, that's a little bit true, isn't it? For, for many of us, we're living for the likes. Why are we living for the likes? 
because we feel that people can affirm us, can esteem us, can, can fill us up. And so you know what we do? We use them. We use people. We use people because that's our golden calf to try to fill us up. That's what we need to affirm us. But the problem is, it's an endless pit a pleasing an idol that can't fill us up. Are you guys still with me here? And you know, here's the problem, is that that idol, whatever you fear, controls you. And so as we make this idol and as we worship it, it gets bigger and looms larger and it backfires on us, doesn't it? Because then, now that idol, which we gave power to in our life, now owns us. This an interesting story about this girl, Sarah. She was this incredibly high-powered athlete. She was like top-notch in three different sports. Like incredible. Like all state, you know, all this kind of stuff. And you would think that for somebody who's incredible at three different sports and popular, you would think that she was living the life, right? I mean, that's, that's so great. But she was feeling stressed. She was feeling overwhelmed. She was feeling like she couldn't keep up. And yet she didn't want to quit any of the teams because she didn't want to disappoint her teammates. She didn't want to let people down. She felt like she had made all these accomplishments and she, what could she do to keep topping what she's already done and keep impressing people? You know, it's a really sad story actually because Sarah went on in college and she took a gun and she killed herself because she felt she had no other way out. That girl, I mean, gosh, I feel like we all, as a society, you know, as a church family, could have gone back in time and our time machine just wrap our arms around her and say, no, 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 you don't understand. It's okay. You can quit that team. It's okay. As a loving, supporting community, but in her mind, the fear of man was so huge, she had no other way out. Her idol had grown up so big that it had ruled her. And that's the thing. You know, it's like, here's our little, you know, golden cat, golden calf, golden cat. And it starts out small, but then the shadow looms larger and larger and larger and larger until soon it's like over our whole life. And we've completely lost perspective. And it's a swirling giant tomato in our life spitting seeds at us. You know, what you fear controls you. What you fear controls you. Will Smith said this, Stop letting people who do, who do so little for you control so much of your mind, feelings, and emotions. Stop letting people who do so little for you control so much of your mind, feelings, and emotions. This week, this week, here's the call to action. I want you to try to burn a golden calf or a golden cat, depending if you're a dog lover or not but I knew some people would freak out if I said the cat thing, so I had to go with calf. I was so close to writing cat up there, I'm telling you. One of my, so I want you to identify, identify one of your top fears of man and try to see if in some little way, I'm not asking for you to do a huge thing, but in just some little way, you can try to tackle that. You can try to take that idol, burn it, grind it up, don't have to drink it, but you get the point. And, and try to tackle it. Identify what is it for you? What are your top, what's your top one or two hitters? You know, for me, part of, I think, one of my greatest fears is looking like a fool or just failing in front of many. And I think that for too long has dominated some of my thinking. And so this last week, as I was meditating on this lesson and I was driving by and I go to this, this um, grocery store where one of the people here, 
Amber Robbins actually works at an awesome grocery store called Native Sun. And as I was driving by, I saw this guy in the street, and he was one of those guys that dances with the sign. You know, and he's doing his thing, and he's got his headphones in. He's like, ooh, you know, not better than that, better than that. And, and then I thought, that guy looks so free. He's so happy. And all these people are driving by. And, 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 and what are they thinking of him? And then it occurred to me, you know what? I think I need to burn my own golden calf. <laughs> and so I had June, who does the media, meet me over there. And this is what happened. <laughs> What's up, man? You got some sweet moves, bro. Listen, I was admiring uh, your dance moves out here. We're doing this series in church on the fear of man and, and uh, how people can be afraid of what other people think. And I was admiring the fact that you're out here getting your groove on, not caring what anybody thinks in the world. So what's your secret? Um, you know, pretty, pretty much I just enjoy what I love to do and that's perform and dance and entertain. Yeah. And so, you know, I mean, for years, you, you know, pe pe people have always, you know, you know, saying, you know, saying that I was crazy and, you know, I was acting a fool and yeah, just it's a whole lot of neck, neck um, tip, tip and stuff. And I get that out here and then on social media as well. But, you know, like a lot of people, you know, say that, you know, I mean, why should you care about what other people are saying? You're doing something that you're... You know that you, you enjoy more. You know, don't even worry about what you know people pe pe are actually saying about you because it's who you are. So I'm not fan to sit over here and you know be something that I'm not and stop. You know, you thy gifts to benefit for His glory. Oh. What's your name, bro? Joseph. Joseph. Jonathan. Oh, it's so good nice to, meet to meet you. Well, I gotta let you know that like I go to the grocery store a lot, Native Son, and every time I go by, you bring a smile to my face. Well, listen, uh, I got to ask you a favor. So I'm going to be honest with you. I'm a white boy without dancing is not my gift. But you mind if I try to maybe draft off? You could show me some of your moves and I could try to imitate some of what you do. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> you know, you do something and like, you know, show, show me, you know, how do you do your thing? What's a specialty? Because we, do we don't do? want to do this anymore. I say it, uh -huh. you say it right. I do a show with Jamie, you know, called the Weekly Download, Jamie and Jonathan, but we could do a dance show with Joseph and Jonathan. What do you think? That's cool. I say it, you say it right, it goes wrong. I can't speak, I feel weak, but I stay strong. I say it, you say it right. Nice. Oh. All right. <laughs> It felt good. It felt good. <laughs> this week, you know, let's burn a calf, okay? Uh, maybe you can do a hashtag free from fear or maybe uh, toasted my idol, something like that. <laughs> but let's just remember that the only thing powerful enough to displace the fear of man is the fear of the Lord. And if you find yourself this week wrestling with overcoming, just think about the example of David because it's not that he never got afraid, but he put it in perspective. And I'm going to close out with this passage before we pray for communion. He says, David says, when I am afraid, I will trust in you. Not that he doesn't get afraid, but he says, when I'm afraid, I will trust in you, in God whose word I praise, in God I trust, I will not be afraid. What can mortal man do to me? And this week, as you're going out and you're dancing or whatever you're doing, okay, just remember, what can mortal man do to you? Your God is huge. People don't deserve to be worshipped. 
God deserves to be worshipped. Let's go ahead and pray for communion. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity that we have to pray to you. God, please help us remember this week how huge you really are. God, that you, although we can't control you, Father, we can't put you in a box. Sometimes we can't even predict what you're doing, but God, I pray that we trust that you have our best interests in mind. God, I pray that we can put our hope and our faith in your big picture. God, I pray that we don't try to control you even according to our own timetable, that sometimes your blessings might be delayed from what we expect, but you will come down. You will send help down from the mountain at the appropriate time. God, I pray that we can identify our fears. We can identify what our top, top idols are. And we can crush them this week. God, please bless everyone watching at home, here in the room. I pray as a loving, supportive community, we can rally together. We can be vulnerable. This can be the safe place to explore our faith that we dream, we hope, that it is and will be so even more. Thank you for Jesus and thank you, God, that he did not succumb to living for the likes, but he lived for you. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen.